Hey guys, this is Jack Thren, and I'm just coming today that I'm... There's, there's a game that I've been playing, um, or at least getting into playing, uh, for Tabletop Simulator uh, and D&D in general. Some of you guys might not know this, but Star Wars is hands down like my most important thing in the world. Um, and so when I found out there was Star Wars, <clears throat> Star Wars D&D versions, and I know there's various ones, but specifically this uh, Star Wars 5e, um, which I looked through and I, I fell in love with it. A um, bit of backstory here, I, I don't want to say I grew up with D&D. Um, over the years, I've always like had many of the books and read through them and tried to get people to come play, but never really happened. It wasn't until uh, 2017 and in 2018, uh, when I actually hosted my first game uh, in the army <laughs> uh, with a couple of my a uh, couple of my buddies, and I fell in love with it. And 5e was great to get into for someone who had never actually DM'd and a bunch of people who had never played before. Um, and Star Wars 5e is very much the same way. Uh, it's not using confusing mechanics of like some of the older editions, um, like 3.5 or 2 or, I mean, I know we don't even talk about 4th edition. Uh, but I do like the the balance of this one compared to many uh, other Star Wars uh, D&D. Uh, I don't remember which one it is, um, but it was a, an older one where if you played any form of Force-sensitive class, you were extremely overpowered and you either had a party of everyone playing Jedi or the people who decided that they didn't want to play Jedi were kind of left in the dark and weren't able to do too much because the Jedi can do everything. <coughs> Star Wars 5e definitely gets uh, kind of gets rid of that. The classes are much more balanced and I've been scouring online and YouTube videos trying to find someone who explains all the classes to me um you know as a new player and I, I couldn't find anything so that's actually what i'm here to do today and i i apologize that i'm like all over the place with what i'm talking about as well as my uh, uh my coffin i got an appointment to figure out what's going on uh finally after like two years of having it um but back to this so basically the video is going to be about uh, each, of, each of the classes within uh, 5e um, and a couple of personal, not 5e, but Star Wars 5e, a couple of personal uh, things that I do that you, after reading through all this that I've done um, to make things a little bit more, how do I put it, equal, more equal. All right, so... First off, there's there's four quote unquote books um, that resolve around uh, SW five E, uh, which you see here: the Player's Handbook, Scum and Villainy, Starships of the Galaxy, and Wretched Hives. Um, basically, the Player's Handbook is the important one, um, and then these are just supplements. They are like the Scum and Villainy is the uh, the Monsters Manual uh, from regular 5e. <coughs> Wretched Hives, I don't know if 5e has one similar to this, but it adds, um, as you can see here, uh, downtime activities, running factions, uh, and enhanced items. Um, so basically this is if you, if you, the DM, or the characters decide that they want to join some sort of faction or you, the DM, has created a faction they're going up against or an ally with or whatever. Um, this gives you all sorts of rules of like, well, this is what, you know, what they're called at level, I want to say like level one. So like, oh, you're a trainee or a recruit or stuff like that. And then how you do things and do missions to eventually work your way up to like the leader of said faction. And then the enhanced items are items that come from being part of the faction. Starships of the Galaxy does two things. Um, it, it further outlines how 
uh, starships work in this game. Um, obviously, it's a Star Wars, so getting into a space battle is kind of important. And it is talked about in the player's handbook, but Starships of the Galaxy really goes into it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, and makes the whole whole thing much more understandable. Um, now, one thing I want to say is that if when you're reading through the player handbook, uh, especially on like I think it's like the first page, really, it talks about how this book was written for the Old Republic era, so that plenty of people can play Jedi uh, and stuff like that. But then when you go through Scum and Villainy, Starships of the Galaxy, and Wretched Hives, uh, everything is. Episode one through six, so the good movies. Um, so you know, I was I was really excited when I started reading the player's handbook. I play Star Wars: The Old Republic, and Knights: The Old Republic Two is my favorite game of all time. And I loved the idea of being able to go back and uh, basically play Kotor One and Kotor Two in D and D with uh, with my friends and. Then I looked at the player handbook doesn't have like any monsters in it. Um, so then I looked at the scum and villainy and everything's like B1 battle droid. And, and so I was like, oh, well, okay. So maybe it's like all time. So you type in Sith and it's like, you know, Sith Inquisitor and what was it? Like the Sith probe. Sith Inqu Yeah, the Sith probe. And I was like, it. And it's like, okay, well, you can use their stat lines and make them your own way, but. Or, you know, name them something different and use them in your campaigns as you want. I'm just saying that a lot of this is, like, the whole building uh, building a starship for Starship of the Galaxy is all about building the Millennium Falcon. I mean, you could use it as a reference to build the Edmund Hawk, but... So, if you're looking into this, just make sure that you know that this is something... Um, that these, these books are episodes one through six. Um, there are... Uh, find it there is uh, somewhere on here there is like a link that'll take you um, uh, to works that other people have done that outline like hey this is what you know a Sith Marauder is and a Sith Inquisitor um, from like the Old Republic era and how to do that like they have Darth Trey and Darth Sion and stuff in there which is nice <laughs> so, there, there's third party stuff that will that absolutely helps you uh, with understanding that stuff. But back to what we were doing today, and that's going over the classes. Um, so, which there are ten, and uh, when I started explaining this to a couple of buddies, and we were getting like characters and stuff together. Um, who have all played 5e, they were like, oh, I'm just going to be, you know, whatever the paladin is and whatever. And that's, that's what I'm going to because, you know, I played the paladin in 5e and I really liked it, so I'm going to be, you know, whatever the quote-unquote paladin class is um, in this one. And, you know, or, you know, I, I want to play the warlock version of this. And it's, those don't exist in this one. It's not a one-for-one -one trade. Um, the berserk, like you can see here, there are a f uh, three uh, classes that are of the same name from uh, D&D 5e, the Berserker, the Monk, and the Fighter. Uh, though those three work pretty sim similarly to those in the, uh, 5e, the other ones don't. Um, and so I'm going to go through each and every one of them uh and kind of give you a rundown of what each of them uh, does. Now, the other thing is is that these things, these classes are split into uh, two types, we'll, we'll say, right? You have your Force-sensitive and your non-Force-sensitive, okay? Um, so your Force-sensitive, of which there are three, is the Consular, the Guardian, and the Sentinel. Um, anyone who has played Knights of the Old Republic uh, or is really big into Star Wars lore, you will you pretty much know the difference of these. <coughs> I'm going to explain these three first. I'm not going to go in order. Um, 
to give you a basic understanding of each of these, right? So we're going to start with the Guardian. Um, there's a picture here. I believe it's the guy from Star Wars The Republic. Yep. Someone from Star Wars The Republic. Um, you guys can go ahead and read this if you like, but basically the Guardian is someone is a Jedi or Force-sensitive that prefers the melee combat aspect of things. Okay. Um, so if you're going to play a Guardian, you're going to jump in, uh, get, you know, get in the combat, beat on people, smack people with your lightsaber or other form of melee weapon if you so choose. All right. Now you'll see here that they're, you know, they do get force powers. Uh, I will go into the force power things when I finish with all three of the <coughs> force sensitive stuff. And then from there, I'll go into other casting. All right, but this is very much um, if you want to be a Jedi and run in and smack things like you like playing the fighter or the berserker or something in 5e, but you want to be a Jedi, uh, that is the Guardian. On the opposite end of that, you have the Consular. <clears throat> Again, those of you who played Star Wars The Republic kind of know what this is, um, or Knights of the Old Republic. Uh, the Consular is the flip side of that. You're not going to be up close and personal with your lightsaber. You can be, uh, but the consular is very much more of your wizard, sorcerer, warlock person, right? This is your distance caster. You're just going to sit back and throw uh, force powers at people. Uh, and then next we have the sentinel. Now the sentinel is an interesting one. Because the Sentinel is what they call the two-thirds caster. Um, so you're, you're equal parts guardian and consular. Okay? You can go up and smack people in the face with a lightsaber, and you can sit back and cast powers. You won't deal out as much damage melee-wise as the guardian. You won't deal as much damage you know, and stuff as the consular uh, when you're using force powers. Uh, but you are a healthy mix of both. Um, the other thing is that the Sentinel is also your Force Rogue. You get lots of uh, skills. Uh, you know, the, the role-playing ones, you know, like lockpicking and stuff like that. Slicing in this game. Um, and so if you want... You know, an equal balance, but you want to focus a bit more on the out of combat role play or just general utility for the party. Sentinel is the way to go. Now, as all three of them, you've seen that they have these um, the force powers, right? Um, there is no whether it's force powers or what's called tech powers for the other classes, which I will get into later. There are no class spell lists. If you have the ability to cast force powers, you can cast any and every force power. Obviously, you know, how many you know, how many points you have, uh, and at what level is the highest you can cast it at. Um, so you can be, there are uh, healing spells, you can be a guardian where you focus on jumping in and smacking people with a lightsaber, and play the healer because you, ha you take a few um, uh, healing spells. Um, or vice versa with the consular, if you want to be a little bit more up close and personal, there are force powers that result that revolve around smacking things with lights there, and you can take those force powers instead. Um, the difference really was is uh, between the three is bonuses to each. Right, the Guardian has bonuses to melee damage. The Consular has bonuses to using the Force. You're using Force powers. Okay. Now, going into the, the quote-unquote tech classes or non-Force user classes, um, which are the Berserker, Engineer, Fighter, Monk, Operative, Scholar, and Scout, uh, Things are, are a little, a little bit harder to explain. So, casting, 
All right, so like here's, you know, the, the go back, you know, the engineer is a tech caster. <laughs> um, tech casting is the exact same as uh, force casting in the sense of if you have the ability to cast tech powers, then it doesn't matter what class you are, you have access to every single one. There's no class list. Um, the difference between force and tech powers itself uh, force powers are like the, I guess you can say like known spells from 5e, and they do not require anything in order for you to cast them. Um, they're, they're, yeah, there's no requirement. Whereas tech requires you to have, uh, I think it's called a wrist pad. And you have to have that on you in order to cast. So if you guys were to go, in, if you and your party were to go in and let's say into some sort of casino where some guy wants to sell you death sticks um, and they make you check everything at the door, uh, then those force players, those force sensitive players, uh, they will still have access and be able to use their force powers. Whereas those of you pl not playing uh, a force class kind of SOL because you don't have your wrist pad unless you can get a hold of one. All right. Uh, now, the, with the rest of these classes, um, they bring over a few things from several other classes. Like they mix fr from the uh, original 5e. They mix certain aspects of like fighter and rogue and, and stuff uh, from other classes. Um, and then those that are <clears throat> similar to the like the base game, the Berserker, the Monk, and the Fighter, <coughs> they make a few changes um, to help balance some of them out. So start. We'll start with Berserker. The Berserker is your uh, barbarian from Five E. Um, uh, here it shows someone. Probably no one really knows who it is. But the best way that I can explain like who a Berserker is um, in common knowledge of Star Wars is Savage Opress. Uh, before he you know, went all force power, uh, you know, when he had that weird staff axe thing and he just ran and, and beat the living crap out of everything, that, that would be a Berserker. The other thing is, um, though we don't really see much of them in – like the movies and stuff, uh, Wookiees. Uh, there's a line in episode four uh, when they're playing, or when 3PO and R2 are playing whatever that game was against Chewie, and Han says, yeah, but droids aren't known, droids aren't known for ripping the arms off their opponents when they lose, referring to Chewie. Uh, so if you, if you ever wanted to do that, you know, be a Wookiee and rip people's arms off. That's the Berserker. All right. Uh, you are a melee damage run up and just smack people uh, as hard as you can with whatever you have. Very, very simple. Um, just like the Barbarian, uh, they have the ability to rage and they get unarmored defense. And a lot of it is, it's not a necessarily a one for one uh, port, but it is. Very, very similar. Uh, next, the engineer. The engineer is the main uh, tech caster of sorts. Um, <clears throat> yeah, they're the main tech caster of sorts for this uh, for this game, and the with the way that tech powers work um, don't think that if oh I'm playing an engineer I have to go build things or fix things I'm a, a mechanic of some sort no if you want to be uh, one, one of the guys that I have is an engineer and he's a medic every tech power that I have is uh, some something that has to do with saving lives uh, and then I think I have like one or two damage abilities. Um, so, you know, Bacta, Colto, 
and uh, stuff like that. That's all tech powers. <laughs> and since I have the most uh, amount of tech powers known, um, you know, I, I make a, a great healer. Um, I, I basically, I basically made the commando class from Star Wars: The Old Republic. Uh, in this game, because I use a blaster rifle, and not a, not an assault cannon, because. Why would a medic need one of those? But they are, like I said, they are the main tech caster. You do have things with being able to repair stuff and all that as well. Um, but just because you have the ability to doesn't mean that like that's what you're stuck as. Next, we're going to go into the fighter, and this one's um, this was like my first class that I played in this game, uh, and it's difficult. To kind of understand how this works in certain ways. Um, for example, you see here, you know, your stormtrooper and your rebel soldier using a blaster. But when you start reading through things, they sound more of a melee class. And the best way that I can explain how to play this is you can. You can absolutely play this as a ranged person or a melee person. You just have to be uh, imaginative with, with the ranged person. You got to be imaginative with your... Uh, oh, what are these called? Your maneuvers. Um, and, you know, like how it would work. Uh, but it, it can absolutely be done. But the way that I ended up playing it was uh, like the Vanguard from Star Wars The Old Republic, where I have a, a, a weapon, but I also have like a sword on my back. And I will shoot people and I'll charge up to them and then I'll pull that sword out and start smacking people around. I guess you can also say I play like Wrecker or Hunter from Bad Batch. I have a ranged weapon, and I use it to great effect, but then when when the enemy gets too close, I start smacking him with a sword. It's pretty simple. Uh, but if you want to play like a Captain Rex or a Commander Cody, they would be uh, fighters. Um, Captain Rex would, you know, you would take the pistol in each hand, which is, I in this game, is... It's not two weapon fighting. It's like dual weapon fighting, because uh, like two weapon fighting is a, a sword in each hand or melee weapon in each hand, and dual weapon fighting is like a blaster in each hand. But they they basically do the same things. Um, uh, one big thing about the fighter is that I, I spoke about uh, maneuvers. Uh, those are now base fighter uh, aspects. You don't have to go into some special uh, archetype for it. Um, you, you, you get that automatically, um, and you get a certain number of them depending on your level. So maneuvers known. You start getting them at level two. Uh, the monk. The monk was a class that I was kind of confused on how it would be in Star Wars. I understand that it's it, they're like religious people and, and or follow of some creed, but I didn't understand like, we don't really see many monks in, in Star Wars. The best I could think of when I thought of like actual monks was the Bomar monks. The weird spider things crawling around um, Jabba's palace. Um, but as I looked through it, I realized this is more of a nod to a couple of old games and one obscure me uh, mention in uh, Star uh, Solo. And the first one is the Achani, which is from mostly from my experience, Knights of the Old Republic 2. Uh, Handmaiden uh, and all of her people, they're all Achani, Handmaidens. Um, mother was like an Achani or dad or something. Yeah. Mother was an Ichani person. Um, and then Atten knows Ichani. Um, so there's that. You know, they focus heavily on the the hand-to-hand -hand combat and certain martial weapons if you wanted to be like them. Or uh, the Tarascazi artists, or Tarascazi monks. I don't know what their official name is. Uh, but they're Taras Tarascazi. Um, I'm probably butchering how you say that. That got one small mention in Solo, 
uh, when Kira beat the crap out of some people, and uh, the droid asks, like, where did you learn to do that? And she's like, oh, Tarascazi. Um, but the other mention, or the other main mention of it, from what I know, is from Star Wars Galaxies, the extremely overpowered hand-to-hand combat at combat combatants known as Tarascazi. Like, you can be a Tarascazi artist in the game, and you just dominate it. Um, and if you played Star Wars Galaxies, and that was your class, and you wanted to do that again, but in D&D, here you go. Um, they they have their focus points, and they, get a bit, they can do things like cast certain force powers uh, by using you know, focus and, and, and things like that. But for the most part, they are very much like the monk from 5e or D&D 5e. Uh, very simple. Basically, you have a limited amount of weapons that you can use, like very specific ones that you can use. Um, and then you run and beat up people on that and you get extra bonuses for doing unarmed attacks and, and stuff like that. Next is the operative uh, this is your sneaky, sneaky. You know, this is your rogue. Um, I don't know how much more to say than that. You mean you get your sneak attack and expertise that you get just like a rogue. Um, you get the abilities to go in and like hack things and uh, and stuff like that. It's very much just the rogue. <laughs> um. The difference is with this uh, is that the operative, the operative is also like if you wanted to be the assassin, the sniper, that sort of thing. That is your operative as well. Anything that deals with stealth, um, that is your operative. Very, very simple uh, to explain. Scholar. This one took me a minute to understand how this works. It is... There's not much they do necessarily in combat. They have very low um, amount of like combat, combat output. But the amount of outside of combat and role playability that they have is astounding. You have the ability to do all sorts of things. You can become, um, you know, like what is it, like the beast master, and you get like a little pet that follows you around and and stuff like that. Um, the best way that I can explain this class is you got to think of a disciple from Knights of the Old Republic two. And for those of you who haven't played or don't know, a disciple was a uh, available party member that you could get if you played a female. And his, his whole thing was he, he wanted to go around the galaxy and discover a bunch of things about the Republic and the Sith and what was happening in the world and so on and so forth. Um, and there was cut content where you were supposed to be able to go over the galaxy and find like these holocrons um, that would help you understand what was going on in the world or the galaxy uh, and so on and so forth. And that's kind of what this guy is for. If you have puzzles that need to be solved or, you know, if everyone's taken, every, you know, if everyone has taken those skills that are useful for, you know, picking locks or intimidating people, but no one has anything to like understand like ancient Sith texts or something, this is the guy that will do it. Like I said, inside of combat, not too much like damage output. They do have abilities that buff the characters around you, so they're useful for that. Um, and then, like, like I'm, I'm telling you, every single party should have a scholar of some sort, whether that's ran by the DM as an NPC or another player to help you go over, like I said, those ancient you know Sith texts and you know, decipher what's on cave walls, because we all know, anyone who's played some of the older Star Wars games know there's a lot of going out there and discovering the mysteries of the, you know, the galaxy and of the Force, and that's the scholar's job, is to discover what all that means. Um, always, always useful to have one of these guys. I know, like I said, I know they don't do too much damage in combat, um, 
but that you could do things like if he's if he's like a beastmaster guy and you're going up against the say some mutilated Nexu, you know, he could use his information that he knows about said animals and DM allowing could give, you know, points of hey, stop attacking the top side, you gotta get it from the underbelly, stuff like that. So now the rest of the party knows where to hit. Maybe they get like an you know, either they hit on advantage or you know, they get a plus two or a plus three on top of everything else because now they know like where to hit it and stuff like that. They are a very useful role playing class, extremely useful and extremely important. Next is the scout. Now the scout, <laughs> the scout, uh, as you see here, kind of looks like your bounty hunter and they, they can be, uh, if you're going to play a bounty hunter, uh, sort of class, I would recommend going the scout because you have the ability to like, track your foes and stuff like that. The scout is very much the ranger um, from D &D, from original D&D &D, uh, with a few extra perks added. Um, they are tech casters similar to the engineer and the operative. Uh, the engineer being, like I said, the main caster um, and then the scout and the operative are somewhere in the middle between the engineer and the fighter. Um, if, like I said, if you want to be like a bounty hunter of sorts, um, the scout is the way to go. But they are also the kind of person you want to be if you want to do like a commando, whether that's you know a clone commando or you know something. If you want to do any form of like infiltrating. Um, not doing sneaky, sneaky, illegal, or spy stuff like the operative, but like the get in, set the charges, and blow something up, that's also the scout. Um, the operative is more of the get in, get out, unseen sort of thing. The scout is get in, find out what's there, blow up what needs to be, kill your way out. Um, so with that, I want to go over two other things, uh, before I call it quits here. First and foremost, I'm going to go back over, uh, powers again. All right. So again, you have two types of casting. You have force and tech. Force is very, very easy to explain, right? It's force powers. It's Star Wars. We know it. We love it. Um, you don't have to have anything, uh, to, to be able to cast. So long as you can use your mind, you can do it, right? Tech casting is different, whereas it is where it requires uh, your wrist pad or some other. They're all say wrist pad, but if your uh, DM allows you to have like a data pad or some other form of it, it's a focus. Okay, it's, it's the D and D focus, uh, something that you have to have in order to cast it. Um, the thing about tech powers is if you go through the site here, let me bring it up. Uh, is tech powers. All right, so if you, if you look here, you have you know player handbook and then uh, EC is uh, extended content. Okay, I don't like using the extended content for tech powers, and I'll tell you why. There is a there is an ability, uh, where is it at, Det detonator, all right, detonator, all right, this is a tech power where you throw a grenade, okay, <laughs> and obviously as you level up, like most powers, um, you know, as you level up, you can deal more damage, so on and so forth, but here's what I don't like about it. Right, is that grenades are also items in the game. And grenades do not level like when they're when they're an item, they do not level with you. So if you have uh, a basic, say, frag grenade <coughs> and you're playing a fighter and you know, that's kind of your shtick where you go out and you throw grenades at things, which is an actual archetype, but we'll get to those in a, in a bit. Um, where you throw grenades and you know you 
you know, you, you love your explosives. When all of a sudden there's this guy who can just pull grenades out and throw them at will, uh, which is basically means cantrip. You can see uh, the different levels here. At will is a cantrip, and then, you know, second level power, first level power, uh, so on and so forth. All right, but there, all of a sudden you have this guy that can just throw grenades willy-nilly, and he doesn't have to go buy, um, yeah, he doesn't have to go buy uh, his equipment. He can just do it over and over and over again. Whereas you, the fighter who specializes in using grenades, um, you have to go and buy your equipment. Like you don't even start with these. So you got to find them or buy them in the in you know the beginning and then throughout the game. Whereas this other guy can just constantly throw it. Um, and there's a lot of that. You know when you look through, you know there's all sorts of abilities that kind of take away from other classes and and their thing. Um, so I, I say, you know, to those of you who are playing uh, either DM or as a tech caster, talk with your DM and be like, I want to take this ability. Is that going to break what other people do? All right. Number one rule in d d to be considerate, especially to the others at the table. Okay. Um, all of the abilities in the basic player handbook side or I, I say are 100% allowed. They don't, you know, trample on uh, other people, right? But when you come to the extended content, there's a lot of things like this detonator ability where it just kind of seems, if not OP, then just trampling on other people, right? Next, I want to talk to you guys. I'm trying to find it here. Uh... Next, I'm going to talk to you guys about archetypes. All right. Now, you see here, I believe all archetypes are... Yeah, no, there are some from uh, extended content, right? So these are all of the... There's 131 uh, archetypes. And you can see here that it tells you, like, oh, of which, of which one. Um, a lot of these are kind of sort of uh, self-explanatory. But I recommend that you go through and read some of them. I recommend starting with the player handbook stuff if you're the first time you're out playing. Uh, but certain ones, you know, if you want to be someone like I have the the fighter up here, right? One of the first characters I was making, like I said, you know, I I I tried by starting by I started. Uh, by trying to make a ranged only person, and basically a clone trooper. Um, and so I was looking for one that was specifically, excuse me, specifically into uh, firearms stuff. And in the player handbook, there isn't much. You have your tactical specialist, um, which gets a few bonuses. Uh, you get extra maneuvers that you could know, which could be useful. But again, a lot of these are uh, more melee based. Um, assault specialist, uh, kind of sort of the same thing. Um, but it's more about, how do I put it? It's a lot like the, oh, what was it? The, the champion for the fighter in... in uh, base D and D, where it just made your fighter more fighty or fighter or, or yeah, uh, where you get like you know an increased crit range and extra damage and stuff like that. It doesn't actually add much more to your class than that. Heavy weapon specialist, that's your using rocket launchers or assault cannons and stuff. Nothing about using. Um, you know, regular blasters and your shield specialist actually gives you access to tech powers um, which would be useful as you know if you want to be like the vanguard or something in in the old republic where you can like put shields and stuff around you or other players that that's what it is but another thing be careful with these classes because depending on how you play some of them give you the ability to all of a sudden use the force and if you I, I, I feel as though 
non-force classes getting the ability to use the force, except maybe like the monk, um, is kind of, I want to say like an OP, not okay. <coughs> if you wanted to be a force-wielding blaster person, you could have just went a Jedi consular or something and taken a blaster instead of a lightsaber. Um, but going three levels before ever getting a force power kind of, to, to me, it just doesn't make sense. Um, again, talk with your DM. If that's something you want to do, go ahead. I don't, if, if to me, if, if you're going to play uh, a force player, then you should play, you know, you should be one of the, the original force uh, classes. And if you're not, then you're not. Now, somewhat, given someone the ability to cast tech powers, perfectly fine. Hey, I got a data pad and a couple of special things. It's nothing too crazy. Whereas getting force powers is, you know, I've spent most of my life being a soldier or something. And then all of a sudden I become, I have the ability to pick people up and throw them. Like it, it just doesn't, doesn't sit right with me. But that's a personal, personal thing. All right. Um, but every single class has a few of these archetypes. Um, most of them you choose just like D&D, you choose at level three. Um, I don't actually know if there's one that you choose at level one. Um, but read through these very, very carefully. Um, and I recommend whenever you're making your character, if you, if you guys play like me, where every single one of your campaigns you start at level one, um, especially if you're playing with new people. Um, whenever you're making a character, I would come and you know think about like where do you want this character to be, like late game, like what what kind of character are you trying to build, and then look at the archetypes to see if one fits that. Um, and if there isn't one, maybe check a different class. Like if you were thinking fighter because you wanted to be like um, like crosshair or something. And you want to be like a nice, you know, kick-ass sniper. You should probably try operative or scout. Um, they will have something that will fit that character build later. All right. So with that, guys, I want to thank you so much for uh, for coming out uh, and watching this video. Uh, I really, really enjoy your guys' support. I hope this makes its way around. Like I said, I went out and looked for someone to explain all of the classes to me. Um, I know this is very, very basic and doesn't explain too much, uh, but it's better than not knowing anything and having to read a bunch. Um, so hopefully this way you guys figure out, uh, hey, I want to make this kind, you know, I want to make this person in this game. Um, and then you'd be like, oh, okay, so that means I want to be an operative or a fighter or, you know, I am going a Jedi person with a blaster. Maybe I should start as a consular and just take a blaster instead. So with that, guys, I thank you so much for coming out again. Uh, hope you guys have fun, uh, and I'll see you in the next video.